Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. So uh, this talk is about writing a plugin for MongoDB Compass. So for people who are MongoDB users um, and who have not used Compass, Compass is basically a graphical user interface on top of MongoDB. Um, so instead of using the shell or using a driver um, to either edit your data, see your data, do any kind of um, administrative tasks, you can now do that with a user interface instead of having to write code for it. Um, it's a React app uh, in Electron, written in Node. Um, so what I want you to get out of this talk is either if you haven't used Compass, use co Compass because it's awesome. Uh, if you use Compass and you decide that it doesn't have some feature that you want to add, um, please do it yourself. Um, I work for MongoDB, which is an open source company. So we are really all about the ethos of, oh, you have a feature request, great, pull request, please. Um, uh, about me, I'm a software engineer. Um, I work in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, and I've been working for MongoDB for maybe four years now. So uh, just a little bit about what you're in for. Uh, first, I'm going to show you Compass so you know what I'm talking about if you haven't used it. Um, then I'm going to talk about where you can fit your plugin inside of Compass visually. So I'm going to go through the features, and I'm going to talk about which ones are pluggable. Uh, I'm then going to go into the architecture of how the plugins are written. Um, so if you are not a MongoDB user, um, but you're interested in implementing plugins for your application, this um, will hopefully be pretty informative. And then lastly, I'm going to program a sample plugin for you so that you can see how easy it is. So, Compass itself. So this is Compass. Um, it looks a little bit odd at the moment because it's super zoomed in, um, but usually this all will fit in one page. So the basic idea is that you specify where you have your uh, server running. Um, as a quick PSA, please do not have an unsecured server on localhost that is open to the public, um, which is what I have right now. Um, so I have just a uh, standalone server running on localhost. Um, I do have a username and password set up, um, which is super easy to do, so I strongly recommend you do it. Um, but so I'm going to connect. Um, I forgot to mention that, uh, oops, it's a little messed up because of the zoom. Well, you can see uh, I have a standalone running on localhost. Um, I can see all of my databases here. Um, there's also a performance window, um, which is right now not very interesting because um, I have nothing running on my server. So uh, there's no load, therefore there's nothing to show. But the idea is if you are a DBA or if you do want to see how your server is doing, you can see stuff like operations, uh, read-write, how much network is using, um, your hot collections, et cetera. Um, so if I look at my test database, um, which should have one collection called restaurants, um, so this is where you actually can explore your data. So you can see it either in a list of documents or you can see it in a table. Um, you can explore, um, depending on if your data lends itself to more columns and rows, or if you have a more flexible schema, you can see your documents however you like. Um, you can also do some schema analysis. So if you want to get a good idea of what your, um, what your documents actually look like. Um, so for example, uh, this data set is a bunch of restaurants in New York City, um, and you can see about 32% of them are in Brooklyn. Um, you can insert uh, any kind of queries you like. Um, there's also an aggregation pipeline builder. Um, next up is the explain plan. So if I'm going to do uh, like an empty query, you can see I don't have any indexes, and I'm doing a collection scan, which is bad. Um, that's going to be slow. So I can go through um, and add an index if I would like. Um, so you can create them, you can delete them, et cetera. All the CRUD operations are supported. Um, there's also a document validation tab. So say you love your super flexible MongoDB schema, but you don't want it to be that flexible. You can uh, enforce rules so that if somebody is inserting to your database, they have to follow um, something like 
for example, I want the field burrow to not exist, or I want it to exist, et cetera. Uh, so that is compass in a nutshell. So now uh, I'm going to try to convince you to actually write one. Uh, so hopefully you saw all of those features and you thought, wow, that has everything I need. But most likely, there's some other stuff you want to see. And since we're a relatively small development team, we don't have time for all the feature requests. Also, users have very, very specific needs. So say you want to run just one query over and over again, or you want to build a chart that uh, shows your data in D3, for example. Um, you can do that all within your own plugin. Uh, another really useful thing about plugins is that you can share them. So something that our uh, support team is really excited about is that they can have users or customers who have an issue, and the support engineer can write a plugin that shows exactly the information that they want to communicate, send the plugin over to the customer, and then all of a sudden they're looking at the exact same thing, and it's as tweakable as you would like. Um, and then lastly, if you are new to React, um, new to Electron, et cetera, um, this is a very neat, small way to get to know how to write a React plugin. Um, that's not what it was for, but it has ended up being um, sort of a neat little project to get started. So something I really want to emphasize is that everything I'm going to tell you is documented online in way more detail. Uh, so we spend a lot of time writing documentation because we really want people to write plugins. So if you have questions um, or if you miss something, everything is written down in many places. So now I'm going to go through what options I have for actually plugging into Compass. So there are five different roles, um, which is basically five different places that your plugin can either fill visually or the type of data access it has. So the first one, um, hopefully that's not too small, is just the header item. So this is where you would put some sort of metadata like uh, what your uh, address is, what the topology of your server looks like, um, and what version you're using. So uh, things to think about if you're going to write this kind of uh, plugin is it's really small. So you probably don't want to have anything interactive. You also are going to have it vis visible for the entire connection. So you probably want to put information here that is true for the entirety of your connection. The next level down from that is the database, or also the instance level. So this is also stuff that's true for the entire connection, but you have a lot more space. So you have an entire tab in which you could put your charts, or you could put um, your queries, or you could put basically anything you want. So this one is called Instance Tab. Um, you, for all the tab plugins, you have first the option to name your tab, and then you have to specify the component that actually you want rendered in that space. So one level down from the instance level is the database level. So this is information that is true for just the database. So in this case, we just show the collections. Um, but there are many different things that are specific to the database that you might want to show in this tab. Uh, for example, if you want to show information from your system.profile collection. So if you want profiling information that is specific to the database, um, you could potentially write a plugin that would render this information. Um, and so this is the lowest level. This is your collection level. So this is where you actually have access to the documents. Um, here we have everything from aggregations to indexes, um, analyzing your query in the explain plan to see if it's optimal, et cetera. So uh, this is also a... Um, large plugin, so this is pretty much where you would put your interactive or your somewhat more complicated plugins. And then the last option is this collection level header item. So this is called a heads up display. This is just for storing information that, again, um, it's a very small UI area, so you would just put sort of metadata. 
but um, you have access to all of your actual documents in this um, particular plugin. So uh, what is a plugin actually made out of? So everything is written in React. Um, and something that's kind of cool about it is that you can write plugins that are identical to the stuff that is inside of Compass. So Compass itself is made up of plugins, but the only difference is that between internal and external plugins, it's just permissions stuff, which I will talk about later. So I'm going to really briefly talk about React. I'm not going to go into detail because that's a different talk. Um, but the basic idea is that in your store, you want to do all the data access or computation, all sorts of communicating with other stores, for example. That's all going to happen in your store. You, once you crunch your data and you know exactly what you want to spit out, you can send that to the component, which just receives data and declares how you would render it. And then lastly, actions are how the communication happens, basically just events. So again, um, actions are events triggered by the user in the component, and that's how the store is able to know something has happened. So uh, we have a set of actions that are internal to Compass, which you can access, or you could write your own. Same thing with components. Uh, this is where you actually define your HTML and indicate how you want your plugin to look. And then lastly, stores. So you can write Reflux Redux, whatever you like. Um, the plugin that I'm going to write for you is in Redux, but actually most of Compass is in Reflux, and there's also a Reflux template um, that you can choose. So that's my very brief summary of React. Uh, the app registry is what brings everything together. So how does Compass learn about plugins and where to render them? And how does the plugin learn about Compass and gain access to all the information that is internal to Compass. So the idea is that the app registry registers all the different components, stores, and actions. Um, and it's available to basically everything. <coughs> so the lifecycle hooks are sort of the handshake that happens between Compass and any plugins. So the activate method is basically the first step. So when Compass starts up, it will look in a specific directory for something that looks like a plugin. So on OS X, it's this one, but obviously will change depending on what your operating system is. It will try to find an activate method in the index.js. And in this activate method is where the plugin registers itself to Compass. So it says, this is the component that I want you to render. These are any actions that I'm going to trigger. And um, this is my store stores, if you like. So this is an example of what an activate method would look like. It's really simple. In this case, you declare that you want a header item. Um, so this is so Compass knows where to render it. And then you're going to register your actions and your store. So the other half of this handshake is the unactivated method. So once everything has been loaded into the app registry, the app registry will then tell all of the stores that have been registered, here is everything else. So you can, in this method, you can decide if you want to listen to a specific event. You can decide if you want to listen to some store written in some other plugin. Um, and the reason that it happens in two separate steps is obviously you want to have everything loaded before you let people access it. So you might end up with a race condition if you didn't have to do this in two separate steps. So this is what it would look like. Uh, in this example, it's just listening to when the data service is initialized. So the data service is uh, basically how Compass communicates with the server. So it's basically a driver. And uh, the other thing is that in this example, it's going to set some internal collection name, depending on what collection the user has specified. Um, so there are a bunch of different events that the app registry emits by default. Uh, this is all documented online. Um, but you can also add events. So if you write more than one plugin, you can communicate between the two plugins. 
So now uh, I'm going to program a plugin for you. So the plugin that I decided to use as an example is basically who the current user is. Um, I just want it to be a header item because it's a small piece of information. Um, I'm not going to have it be interactive. And I know that it's going to be global to the entire collect, uh, connection. So if the user changes, you have to log out and log back in. So I don't have to worry about um, this changing over the course of the connection. Uh, the other thing that you need to know about the current user uh, is that the information is stored in this connection status command. So connection status has a bunch of other information, um, but it also includes what you need to know about the current user. So this is what we want the final product to look like. Um, just a very simple little piece of information in the header indicating who is logged in. Or if there is nobody logged in, there is no current user. So the first thing you want to do um, is to get the template. So we provide a template that has um, almost everything you need for writing a plugin. Um, it's a really simple just on, off button uh, template, but it has everything set up so that you could just modify the component stores and actions as you would like. So you get the uh, template through something called chaos. Um, so basically just get the, get the copy of the plugin. Um, and I strongly recommend you initialize any version control you're going to use immediately after cloning, because then you can know what you've written and what's just either boilerplate or comes with a template. Um, and then you have to run npm install. So I can do that here. Um, and then I'm going to call it who am I, uh, because I'm asking who the current user is, and so I might as well name it after the command. So um, right now it's going and getting the repo, which has the template. Um, I'm going to call it who am I. So this is the name that all of the components and pieces are going to get generated with this name. Um, the description is basically just for documentation. So uh, call it pretty straightforward. Um, and then this is where you specify the role. Um, so the plugin will actually change depending on how you want it to look. So I'm going to call that. Great. So now I have everything I need to write a plugin. Um, I need to run npm install next, which takes forever, and I don't want to have to download Electron over uh, conference Wi-Fi. So I actually had it pre-installed except for this one has node modules already. Um, magic. So I'm going to start it. So what's cool about um, the plugins is that they are all React applications that can all be run independently from Compass. So you can do your development completely without having to worry about what's going on inside of Compass. Um, so once this compiles, I have my plugin. So this is what it looks like before you've made any changes to the template. Um, there's just a toggle status button so that um, you have an idea of how state is tracked between the three components. So next up is I'm going to refresh Compass so that uh, what's happening right now is now it's looking inside of the um, right directories, but I actually forgot to. So this is something that you're never going to have to do. But what this is doing um, is basically just turning off the plugin so that Compass doesn't render it. Um, and because I had it pre-installed, I didn't want it to show up in the demo of Compass I did at the beginning, because that would be confusing. So if you do want to turn your uh, plugin off, this is where you would do it. So now I can refresh Compass. And it will actually load up the plugin and figure out where it goes and et cetera. So now if I connect. I have a little current status here, which is super tiny. So I can zoom in again. There we go. So that's what um, the current status looks like. 
All right, so now let's actually start developing. So again, this is what it looks like without it. This is what it looks like without any changes to the plugin, but the plugin template already there. And this is what it looks like on standalone. Um, so you have all already seen this, but um, since the slides are going online and I want them to make sense, I also put screenshots in. Cool, so the first thing I'm gonna do is uh, look at my store. So um, as I mentioned before, what I wanna do in my store is once I know that everything is activated, I uh, want to just run a connection status command, get my user information, and then set the state. And then also make sure that I set my initial state. So if there is no user or if there's an error, anything like that, I also have something there and not just a bug. So I'm gonna cheat a little bit here because this is a lot of code and I don't wanna make typos. So um, unfortunately this is super tiny, but um, inside of source you have your components, stores, <coughs> and actions. And so in my store, this is what um, the unactivated method looks like. It's Right now, got everything um, commented out, so you can't, so nothing's happening. Um, but what I wanna do is I wanna uncomment this data service uh, connected event. So basically, when Compass has made a successful connection to the database and authenticated and everything is well and good, I then wanna run my command and say, who has authenticated? So I can just paste this in here. So what this is doing, is saying if there's been no error, then run my command. My command gets run on the admin database. I run the command connection status, and then I set the state depending on if the result comes back with the authenticated users. So um, if there is an error, then I just set it to null. Because I wanted this example to be really simple and very easy, I'm not really gonna do much error handling. Um, I'm just gonna say no user if there's been either no user or no connection. Um, but I assume when you make your plugins, you'll do some actual error handling. So um, that's all I need to do in terms of connecting to the database. The other thing I wanna do is make sure that I set my initial state correctly. So I can get rid of this toggle status um, method entirely because I no longer have that toggle button. Um, and I can set my initial state to just null. Oops. Um, so, yep, so now I have my initial state. So that's it for my uh, store entirely. Um, if you're curious what the other half that handshake looks like, in the index.js, it has this activate method which is automatically generated. I don't need to really change anything here because I just want my role and I want my store to be registered. Um, I could also get rid of this because there are not gonna be any actions in my plugin because it's static. There's no user interaction. So. Next up is I want to update my component so it actually renders what I want it to render. So um, the user and role are gonna get passed to the component as properties and I just want my component to render them. And if there is no user and role, I wanna render no user. So again, I'm going oops, to cheat a little bit and just copy and paste this part so that you don't have to watch me type. So in my components, this is the toggle button, which I can just get rid of entirely because I don't need it anymore. And then inside of my root component, um, I can get rid of this import. I can set the change my props because I'm no longer accept, uh, expecting actions or status. So. Uh, I'm gonna set them to string. Cool. Um, and then default props 
might as well, just something to know. Um, and then I don't need any on click handler. And I can get rid of this, um, just this is a plugin, this is my toggle button because I don't need it. Um, and replace that with what I copied from my slide, which is just do I have a user prop? Uh, if I don't have a user prop, then I'm just going to render no user. And if I do have a user prop, I'm going to render the user. So pretty straightforward stuff. So next up in the process of writing a plugin would be writing your actions, which I'm not going to do because I don't have any actions. Um, same thing goes with styles. I pretty much just want to get rid of all styles so I can let the compass default styles take over um, because it's a tiny little thing in the corner. I really don't want to do anything fancy with it. So the um, style uh, files are in less, and they are going to be right next to the component inside of the folder. Um, the reason it's constructed like this is we're using Webpack to build it. So the really nice thing about Webpack is First of all, it can be run on its own, um, but also it will automatically recompile anytime you press save, so you can see um, what's happening in real time. So I'm going to go in and get rid of any style for now. Just leave it be. Cool. So that is pretty much everything. Um, first thing I want to do is I want to run it standalone to see if it actually has been successful and I don't have a bunch of errors. Do you look at that? It's tiny. But no user, which makes perfect sense because I haven't actually put my username and password anywhere. Um, so it wouldn't have any way of authenticating. So it's not successfully doing that. So there's no user. So now. Um, uh, since I didn't run npm watch, I'm just going to run compile here. Um, so that will rebuild it just so that compass knows to pick up and re-render. And then I'm going to refresh it. Um, I'm going to refresh compass so that compass knows to look again for any plugins and also look for any changes. So I'm going to connect with my favorite, which has my username and password. And if you can see, which you totally can't because it's tiny, I now have a plugin that is showing up in Compass that has the authenticated user in their role. Um, so again, this looks familiar. This is what it looks like on its own once you've finished making all the changes. Run it in Compass, and we have ourselves a plugin. So, what I want you to get out of this is that it is super easy to write a plugin. You can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, this is also really new, so we're just now um, sort of publicizing it and getting people to write plugins. So if you have any issues, if you find the documentation confusing, if you want support, um, just email us, and we will do our best to help you. As I mentioned before, um, everything is documented online. So we spent a lot of time writing documentation. Uh, we have a docs team that has helped us out a lot. Um, and so it's all on the official MongoDB docs page. And then also the plugin that I just wrote, as well as all of these slides, are up on GitHub. So uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the security restrictions. So because this is super new, um, we basically wanted to go safety first and make sure that people aren't writing a plugin or downloading their friend's plugin and then their friend decides to wipe all of their data. So uh, these are all things that you cannot do. Um, we're moving towards a permissions-based security model so that if you decide to let your friend delete all your data, you totally can. Um, but for now, um, the idea is that you're not supposed to be making external connections, but you can definitely still do that just through MongoDB Stitch, um, which basically just allows a layer of indirection so that we know you're not doing anything bad. So future plans. Um, we eventually will have something that looks like um, an app store for plugins where people can 
publish their apps, they can find other people's apps, they can fork apps and make their own changes, um, and also there'll be some kind of auditing by MongoDB so that we can publish apps that we have um, looked at and approved. So until then, we can basically just treat MongoDB Compass plugins the same way that we treat MongoDB community drivers. Um, so if you have a favorite programming language and you want to write your own driver, um, we can provide help and support and we can market it for you um, since it is an open source company. So something else that's sort of interesting to talk about um, is that Compass itself is closed source um, because it's proprietary, it's an enterprise tool. Um, but because we can choose both internally and externally what plugins we want to include, we can make different builds of Compass. So right now there's a Compass Community Edition, which is free to use, which has um, fewer features than the, uh, it, the Enterprise Edition. There's also uh, customers we have that want like super extra lockdown mega security version of Compass, like banks, for example that don't want their user to have any kind of CRUD ability or any way of seeing what's actually going on in the database. So that's another cool feature is you can basically make any flavor of Compass that you like. Um, but the idea is that you are free to make whatever you like out of Compass. So I want to thank uh, everyone on the Compass team and also the organizers of the conference for having me. And then also thank you, obviously, everyone for coming. Um, yeah. So that went a lot faster than I expected. So we have a lot of time for questions if anybody wants to ask anything. Hi, thank you for the great speech. Uh, so I have two, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, how to debug the plugins. Uh, and uh, the second one, do you have any uh, data in your test electron app to simulate uh, how your compass works? Yes, um, so in terms of debugging plugins, we have, um, first of all, you can debug your heart out with a console if you would like. Um, but if you want to debug it when it's inside of Compass, we have um, a, there's a window that basically indicates um, if you have, what plugins you have installed, if you have any errors happening in your plugin, if you have any security violations in your plugin that are getting blocked. Um, so this right now is all green because I haven't done anything wrong. Um, but if I were to try to access the file system or if I were to make a connection to some unknown um, address, then it would show up here and say big red with the stack trace so you can actually see where inside of your code is causing the exception to be uh, triggered. Uh, and then in terms of inside of the plugin itself, so we're running the plugins in standalone mode in Electron. Um, and I wish that was larger, but um, we have basically everything that, just some boilerplate to get it showing up inside of this Electron app. And so in this case, this is where you could choose to, so this is where the connection is happening. So if I did want something to show up um, here, so say I wanna actually log on here to um, simulate what it looks like. Uh, that's my demo password. I promise I haven't used it for anything else. So then this will refresh. Um, and for whatever reason, maybe that's not actually my password. I can't remember. Um, but there's an error. Anyway, the idea is that not only can you set the connection here, but you can also ask the app registry to admit any events you like. So in this case, it's emitting the data service initialized on connection, um, but you can s set like a query, for example, and then ask your app registry to admit a query applied um, event. So basically any uh, event you want triggered, you can find in the documentation and then you can just tell the app registry to trigger it. 
Uh, more questions? Um, <clears throat> what are the benefits of using this UI instead of just command line? Um, if you are learning MongoDB, it's a lot easier. Um, also, there's no way to like visualize charts or graphs um, in the command line. So if you wanted to see the information that was in the performance tab, you could run mongo top, which looks like the top command, which personally I don't find very useful. But if you're like really used to reading top, you can always just use the data directly. Um, but what's nice about it is that not only can you share stuff, but since the entire ethos behind MongoDB is that it's supposed to be really easy to use and not sort of intimidating to beginners, but also really powerful. You can have a very fine-grained control over what you want to allow people to do or get people to learn or even have people see your point. So you want to say, look, I can create this really cool graph from my server data, but don't look over at this stuff. It's really complicated, and I don't want you to get overwhelmed so just look at this stuff over here. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Thank you for, present for, for presentation. Uh, um, Compass looks like uh, a regular uh, Electron application. Uh, did you make any changes on Electron level, level or for any uh, for any reasons, like security reasons or something else? Yeah, uh, we definitely did. Um, so there are a few examples that I'm trying to think of, mostly for, for security. And also, we did some stuff with, um, there are features like uh, query history. So if you write. Um, a bunch of queries and you want to save them and you want to quit Compass and you want to have it uh, there when you restart it, um, that's getting saved locally. And I don't remember the specific details because it was a while ago, but I remember having to go in um, and change some stuff that was built into Electron. Can't give you a better answer than that, unfortunately, because I don't remember. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, with regards to security issues, uh, can you uh, elaborate a bit more how you make sure that there are no outcoming or incoming requests? And what do you mean by uh, permission-based uh, security? Because you mentioned something like that. Sure. Um, so for permission-based security, the idea is that, um, so if you write a plugin now and your plugin tries to connect to some even local uh, address that isn't through the data service, um, it will throw an error, which will get caught, and then Compass will say, you're doing something wrong. We're going to stop it. But instead of just saying no, it'll pop up and say, do you allow this application to access this address? Um, or do you allow your application to read from your file system? Sort of in the same way that, like, uh, apps on your phone work, um, or even apps on your desktop. It basically lets the user know exactly what you're going to do in the plugin, um, and that way the user can decide whether or not they want to take that risk for themselves. Um, in terms of right now making connections, so this is MongoDB Stitch, which is our backend as a service offering. So you are always free to connect to MongoDB Stitch. What you do from your Stitch app is totally up to you and also audited by Stitch itself. Um, so in that case, we're basically preventing people from making arbitrary connections, but also allowing them, if they want to set up a service, they can connect through this service. It's not ideal because it means you do have to set up something on Stitch. But um, the idea is that this is something you can do for now until we get a more flexible and more comfortable security policy in place. Okay, thank you.
No more questions? Uh, okay, then we can finish. Uh, thank you for the speech. Uh, uh, we have the lunch uh, after this meeting.